Hello and welcome to day six of Women in Antiquity. Today we're going to be talking about gender and the ancient Hebrews. So, um, a little bit of preliminary stuff, uh, just to be aware that there are a number of uh, important things that are coming up quickly. Uh, first of all, the proposal for the position paper is due on Monday, that is day seven. The representations and images paper is due on Friday, uh, which is uh, day 11. And then the, um, the final week, the um, um, position paper is going to be due on the 23rd. You can give me an optional draft um, as late as the 20th if you want for me to give you some uh, feedback. The, um, there's no official meeting on the 19th, uh, which is a, a federal holiday, Martin Luther King Day. Um, but, um, you know, I will be available, you know, uh, as usual for uh, questions and, um, and uh, you know, to run ideas past me for, you know, how to treat a topic, what sources to look at, and so forth. We'll talk a little bit more in... Um, one of my upcoming lectures about um, using sources and talking about, um, you know, uh, structuring the paper and so forth and so on. Uh, if you have questions about the papers, uh, the paper and the essay, uh, it might make sense to post them in the question forum because chances are other people will have questions similar to yours. Um, for the proposal, once again, uh, the information about this is in the position paper handout. You know, all I'm looking for is a, you know, a brief uh, a thumbnail of how you're going to approach the, uh, the, the paper. And it's not a binding contract. I'm not holding you to this. Uh, it's rather so that you're thinking about it now because it's going to come up uh, very quickly and you're going to be needing to, to find the materials you're going to use uh, um, now uh, so that you can write the paper you know, in time for the uh, for the deadline. Um, the proposal is actually sort of um, a lot like the introduction to your paper. I'm going to be looking um, primarily for uh, a, a thesis statement, a, a statement of opinion that someone could disagree with. And this is vital. This is going to be the absolute keystone of your paper. Uh, I do not want the paper to be a narration of historical events. Um, I want this paper to be uh, an argument of a position. And so it's going to need to be a very clearly defined statement, something that you could say, you know, I believe X. And it needs to be something that could be argued about. You know, um, you know it can't be a statement like, uh, uh, you know, women are biologically different from men. You know, this is not something that someone would disagree with. Um, you know, uh, rather the, you know, you would, you would want a, an argument like um, women of Sparta were not as free as, uh, as some people like to say, and, and perhaps make it more specific, you know, that uh, they were not free, as some people like to say, in that X, Y, and Z. And that will focus and fine-tune what it is that you need to demonstrate in your paper, um, you know, the, the evidence that you're going to need to present and, uh, and interpret in order to uh, convince the reader, in order to, to demonstrate your, your thesis. Um, and uh, ideally, in this, uh, in this introduction, and so therefore, in your proposal, um, it would be a good idea to delineate what the opposing sides of this uh, uh, of this debate might be. So, you know, ideally the the proposal and eventually the introduction to your paper should um, should uh, state what the problem or debate is, what the question is that you're specifically addressing what the two sides of it might be. Some say, others say, is one way of looking at that. Uh, and then, you know, your thesis statement, I believe, um, or, you know, some, it doesn't have to use the words I believe, obviously, but it needs to be an expression of opinion, an expression of opinion that someone could disagree with. 
Uh, all of this is in the Elephant Pamphlet, by the way. So uh, take a look at the Elephant Pamphlet for a good deal more on the approach to, uh, um, to addressing a problem, uh, to showing the sides, and to giving your thesis uh, statement. Uh, in addition, in, in your proposal, if you want, uh, you can go a little bit further and talk about uh, what it is that you're, uh, that you're actually going to um, want to try to address in the paper. So between now and the proposal uh, on Monday, on day seven, it would be a good idea for you to not only have chosen your topic, but to have done some background reading on this subject. Um, and this includes, you know, any of the readings for the course that pertain to this, but also to, you know, to do some preliminary search. Uh, you can look at what's available on the internet. You can even look at Wikipedia for background on this to familiarize yourself with the subject. Later, when you write the paper, most of what's available on the internet is not going to be usable as a source, and that definitely and definitively includes uh, uh, Wikipedia. Um, you know, tertiary sources are not allowed, and that includes uh, encyclopedias and textbooks and, you know, most of what's on the, on the Internet, with the exception of, um, with the exception of uh, uh, online uh, scholarly journals available through JSTOR and other academic databases through the Lehman Library website, and, um, uh, and transcriptions of primary sources that are available on, you know, websites that, for example, are linked to in the, the ancient sources uh, uh, links on my site. Uh, so, once again, we'll be talking about this a little bit more, you know, over the coming days, but uh, for now you need to think about what it is you're interested in writing about. Take a look at the topics, take a look at, um, you know, some of the things that we're going to be saying about this, and, and you know, uh, and, and, and draw yourself to what it is that you're interested in, in, in asserting an opinion about. Um, when, you're pre when you've prepared the position paper, uh, when you prepare the proposal for the position paper, uh, you need to submit that through the um, writing assignments app uh, in the uh, in course content. So if you go to course content, toward the top there's a folder for writing assignments, and there's uh, there's uh, uh, objects for the three um, written assignments: the um, proposal the images essay, and the final position paper. Once again, if you have any questions about that or uh, want to bounce ideas off of me, send me an email or post questions in the questions forum. Uh, another reminder, if you're interested in doing more ancient history, uh, this semester I'm going to be teaching both Civilizations of the Ancient World and History of Ancient Rome. History of Ancient Rome will be Thursday nights um, from 6 to 840. And so if, if that intrigues you, please go ahead and sign up for that. Okay, so the Hebrews. Uh, so background on the Hebrews, um, as uh, you may very well already know, the uh, and uh, actually, uh, as I mentioned um, in the lecture on the Egyptians, the uh, new kingdom of Egypt developed a, a need uh, for a large subclass of laborers, and this drew uh, the, the wealth of Egypt and the, um, uh, uh, and the, the, the growing population of these, um, of these laborers brought a large number of people from the, east, uh, from the lands east of Egypt in the Fertile Crescent, most of whom are various nations of Semitic peoples, and this includes um, Phoenicians, Canaanites, uh, uh, Hebrews, and, um, you know, uh, Assyrians and Babylonians, Chaldeans, um, uh, uh, Arameans, and so forth and so on. Uh, the uh, Most of these nations uh, sort of held together in their own little um, subcultures, uh, it, within Egypt, and so the, the Hebrews were aware of themselves as a nation, and uh, they were highly populous, and, uh, you know, they took their opportunity when Egypt was at its weakest during wars with, um, with the Hittites 
uh, and uh, at the very brink of the collapse of the Bronze Age to escape from Egypt and return to their original homelands in Canaan, in um, what, is, uh, what, is, uh, what is now uh, Israel and Palestine and Syria, the eastern shores of the um, Mediterranean. Uh, one of the things that's uh, striking about Canaan, the, the, the land that um, <clears throat> the, the general term for the eastern shores of, Medi of the Mediterranean, uh, is that um, it's uh, uh, throughout ancient history it's being fought over by surrounding empires most of the time. And so uh, you don't see the arising of powerful peoples in Canaan uh, uh, except when the surrounding empires have all been weakened and devastated. And so, you know, during the Bronze Age, Egypt and the, the Hittites and the Assyrians are all fighting over Canaan and all, you know, grabbing it this way and that way and this way and that way. Uh, Canaan changes hands and armies are marching through and there's, um, there's periodic battles for control over, over Canaan and Syria uh, and, uh, and so forth and so on. But when, uh, and, uh, when the Bronze Age collapses... And the Bronze Age empires fall. Uh, there is finally an opportunity for the uh, the the nations of Canaan to uh, to be strong and independent. And so it's during this period, as we can see on this timeline, uh, the the fall of the of the Bronze Age occurs around 1100 or so, and it's after this that uh, that. Uh, not only does Israel rise, but we see the emergence of the uh, the Phoenicians as powerful traders, able to um, develop a, a great uh, wealth and and uh, an extensive uh, trade network throughout the entire Mediterranean, the Aegean, and even the Black Sea, uh, and uh, the Philistines as well arise as a separate, powerful, uh, you know, um, independent people at the southern end of Canaan in what had originally been Egyptian territory. The Philistines are the sea peoples, um, the refugees from the Aegean that uh, helped to disrupt Egypt and bring about the, the period of calamities and the fall of, of, the, of the Egyptian kingdom. Uh, and so the, the Philistines are very much outsiders in Canaan. The Philistines are uh, Indo-Europeans. Uh, they, you know, Greeks uh, and, and other peoples from, from the Aegean surrounded by Semites, um, linguistically different, ethnically different, uh, and as it turns out, culturally, socially, religiously, and technologically different. The Philistines are able to hold out and preserve their power and, and independence surrounded by all these hostile Semitic peoples uh, because they are the, um, they are the people that have the earliest control over iron in Canaan. And so um, they are able to equip their armies better. They are able to uh, um, you know, conduct their uh, agriculture better. They have a higher standard of living. Um, their cities are stronger and more centralized, and so forth. Uh, by contrast, the Hebrews moving into Canaan uh, uh, after the Exodus uh, have a number of problems. Uh, first of all, Canaan is already occupied by the Philistines, the Phoenicians, and other Canaanites. Uh, and uh, the, the, all, of these, uh, all of these peoples, the Phoenicians and the Philistines and so forth, are, are, are wealthy and successful. Um, they have control of the, of, of the best ground for the cities, and uh, they have the control of the resources, land and water, and uh, you know, natural resources. Um, the, uh, the Hebrews coming into Canaan are, um, you know, are end up with the, you know, the, the unsettled lands in between the cities of the, of the Canaanites, and they are further divided into separate tribes. 
Um, and uh, so each of these tribes operates independently under the rule of, uh, of, of, of a chieftain, which is normally translated into English as uh, the judges. Um, eventually, the Hebrews are able to uh, defeat the Canaanites, and as they gain control over the, uh, the, the wealth and, and cities of, of the Canaanites, uh, they, they gain strength and are able to eventually subdue the rest of the Canaanites um, uh, as far as, you know, the lands to the south of the greatest of the Phoenician cities. So the, the Phoenicians still endure to the north and what is now Lebanon, um, the great cities of, of Tyre and Sidon still remain um, powerful trading cities of the Phoenicians. Um, but uh, the the Hebrews are able to take the the rest of the lands of Canaan for themselves and surround and uh, and and uh, force into submission the Philistines eventually as well. And this brings about the creation of the kingdom of Israel, which for a time thrives and grows in in, in uh, uh, impressive proportions. Uh, and so, of course, you know, no sooner does this happen that, uh, you know, the surrounding empires are also uh, undergoing their recovery from the collapse of the Bronze Age. And by uh, 900, we see the start of a, a new uh, Assyrian Empire, the Iron Age Assyrian Empire, emerging in the northern lands of, of Mesopotamia. And uh, as uh, the Assyrians expand, this is at the expense of everyone else who had been strong and independent, uh, you know, during that intermediary period, uh, and this includes uh, the Hebrews. Um, and uh, things don't get better even after the Assyrians eventually climax and crash and, and are defeated because what comes after the Assyrians is the even stronger empire of the Persians. More on that in a moment. Um, the main problem that the Hebrews have in, in coming into, uh, into um, Canaan is, is essentially one of identity. Uh, they are divided by tribes, and also there's a real problem that, uh, you know, especially among the young people that, uh, you know, as people are seeing the, you know, the, the wealth and, and happiness of the Canaanites, uh, you know, there's a real risk of, 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 you know, defection and assimilation of people uh, being drawn into the, uh, the communities of the Canaanites and being lost to the Hebrews. Uh, and so the solution to both of these things, both of these problems, is to, is to forge a much stronger Hebrew identity. Uh, and this is true not just socially, but also religiously. Uh, there's, a, there's a attraction to the way that, uh, that the pagan religion of the Canaanites is practiced. Uh, the, the chief god of the Canaanites that we hear about in the Old Testament is a figure known as Baal, whose, uh, whose, whose festivals and rites had a distinctly uh, carnal uh, air. Uh, uh, there's a uh, you know, there's um, both uh, physicality and uh, and wine involved in a way that's sort of reminiscent of the uh, Dionysian celebrations of the Greeks. Uh, and so the uh, a Hebrew identity needs to be forged around uh, a, a single focus. And this leads to um, the emergence of a need for a single king, um, uh, not just uh, militarily. The military need is is obvious. Uh, the tribes are pursuing their own strategies and taking land for themselves away from the Canaanites. They ally with each other only occasionally and reluctantly, uh, and as a result, the Hebrews are you know making headway uh, only with great difficulty. Uh, the um, uh, and so there is a there is a potent military need for a a king.
king of all the Hebrews, which is reinforced by a need uh, for an identity focus that the king will serve. Uh, and this is paralleled in the emergence of, a, uh, uh, of the idea of a single God. The, uh, the kingdom of, of Israel, once it is established, becomes immensely successful and, and strong, um, and it, uh, it expands considerably uh, at the expense of many surrounding peoples uh, and becomes a, you know, a preeminent force in the vicinity uh, and, you know, if, if anything, becomes a sort of byword for, you know, the, the the regal splendor of, of its capital Jerusalem uh, you'll notice that uh, that at the heart of uh, of the the kingdom of the Hebrews are actually a north and a south if you look at the, the map here uh, at the heart of the you know the Hebrew territories are those in the north that are called Israel and those in the south that are called Judah and eventually, after the uh, the reign of Solomon, which is uh, you know so uh, famous for its its wisdom and power and success that Solomon today is a is a synonym for for wise ruler, um, the successive kings aren't able to measure up. The kingdom of Israel not only retracts, uh, no longer able to hold on to the lands that it conquered, but also. Uh, breaks apart into two separate kingdoms, Israel and Judah, and uh, never to be uh, reformed again. Um, and this is during the period in which, um, just as uh, as Israel is is succumbing to its weaknesses, uh, this is the period in which the Assyrians are coming uh, into increasing aggression and imperialism. Uh, so here we see the the heart of the uh, the neo Assyrian Empire, uh, the dark green in the center. Uh, the word Assyrian comes from the original city of Asher, which you can see on the uh, on the Tigris right in the center of the um, uh, of the territory. Uh, the capital of the neo Assyrian Empire is actually Nineveh, which is uh, some ways to the north. Um, and so the neo Assyrians um, uh, begin developing this uh, this um, this uh, much more um, uh, an, an evolution in the idea of, of empire it is it is much larger and stronger and 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 conquers more territory and uh, it is famous for the its uh, its attention to things like civil engineering to the construction of roads and bridges and aqueducts that uh, make the Assyrian empire more interconnected than any other empire had ever been the problem with the, Ass uh, the Assyrian empire is that it rules through violence intimidation and oppression um it uh, uh, it uh, it um, demeans and oppresses and destroys all of the uh, the peoples that it rules over because it demands submission not merely to Assyrian rule but to uh, to Assyrian culture and religion. Um, the traditions of the peoples that uh, they rule over are uh, subverted and uh, and uh, and um, treated with immense uh, scorn and suspicion precisely because uh, these are the things that are you know that are most dangerous uh, you know, one's cultural identity one's uh, sense of who one is in terms of one's society that is the thing that will cause you to uh, cause you to you know resist rule by an overlord and so the Assyrians seek to rub that out uh, in order to have docile, uh, fully conquered subjects. Um, and so one of the means by which they do this is the, the subjects that um, seem to be most in danger of failing to surrender their identity and heritage end up being 
um, either uh, you know the their key cities might be destroyed, or what happens in the case of Israel, the Northern Kingdom, is that uh, the, uh, the the bulk of their population is deported entirely. Uh, the um, the people of the northern kingdom of Israel uh, are um, are seen to be too much of a threat to rule over, and so the Assyrians uh, uh, deport them into Mesopotamia and disperse them, and they are submerged and assimilated into you know. Uh, Mesopotamian uh, culture and society, and vanish. Um, they are lost. Um, eventually, um, this practice of rule by the Assyrians becomes intolerable to everybody that uh, they rule over. Um, their empire extends as far to the west as, uh, as Egypt and as far to the east as as uh, as Afghanistan, um, but the people that they rule over um, become more and more uh, unable to deal with the oppression involved uh, and the, the level of violence and destruction and and uh, and destruction uh, at the at the level of of, of heritage and culture. Um, the uh, the Assyrians regularly raid the peoples that they rule over. Uh, and steal from them their their art, uh, their books. Uh, one of the greatest libraries in the world existed under the uh, Ashurbanipal at Nineveh, precisely because he saw books as as booty, um, as uh, as the the spoils of of war, uh, and uh, not for their you know their intrinsic uh, you know value uh, in terms of knowledge. Uh, and so eventually the um, uh, the uh, the peoples that the Assyrians rule over um, begin to to fight back. They begin to band together. Uh, ultimately, the the Chaldeans of Babylon rise up with the support of the Medes and throw off the Assyrians, and the Assyrian Empire collapses and and uh, and breaks apart. Uh, what is what this replaces is um, the preeminence of Babylon itself as. Uh, not a, an empire so much as uh, an immensely influential uh, city, a, a a beacon, and, and you know, and and uh, and and magnet for uh, all of the peoples of of Mesopotamia and, and the surrounding area. This becomes the center of of learning, knowledge, culture, as well as the center of power. Um, but it's a it's a somewhat different kind of power. Uh, and this is represented by you know the the you know one of the uh, wonders of the ancient world, the hanging Babylon's uh, of ba uh, hanging gardens of Babylon, in which you know the nature is made to flourish in the heart of the you know the stone city of Babylon. Uh, the story of the Tower of Babel is uh, is remembered today because it's preserved in uh, in Hebrew literature. Uh, and um, you know the the Hebrews, who, as we'll see in a moment, had a certain amount of of, of enmity toward the Babylonians, uh, tell this story as a story of hubris, of of an attempt to reach the heavens. And so, you know, in that version, the uh, the the pride of the Babylonians is published by punished by having all of their workers. Um, you know, uh, separated by uh, countless different languages, and so unable to understand each other, and so unable to complete the tower. Um, the origin of this story is an actual, you know, real building. One of the most magnificent uh, temples of the ancient world, uh, uh, the uh, the great uh, ziggurat of um, Marduk, the patron god of, of Babylon. Uh, this ziggurat was uh, was uh, immense, much larger than any ziggurat that had ever been uh, attempted in the ancient world, and represented the uh, the majesty of of Marduk, the god, but also the majesty of Babylon as well. Nonetheless, even though Babylon was a different kind of power, 
the the uh, the identity of the Jews was so strong and potent, um, the Jews being the people of Judah, the remaining Hebrews in Canaan, uh, that um, in this instance, they saw the need to emulate the Assyrians and deport the people of Judah uh, to Babylon. And so... This is an extremely important period of, of Hebrew history because it's during the Babylonian captivity, during the time in which the Jews are, are resettled in Babylon, uh, that the, the Jewish identity and the true nature of the Jewish religion is born. Um, because um, the, the, the people of Judah saw what happened to Israel, saw the fact that, that Israel was dispersed and lost and become absolutely determined and obsessed with the idea of preserving their identity at all costs. And so they, um, they, um, they Im immerse themselves in, in traditions and taboos that fundamentally separate them from the Babylonian peoples around them. And they uh, they um, they shape an identity of themselves as a people protected by their God. And that their God uh, and uh, the, the Jews have entered into a unique covenant uh, to, to essentially look after each other. The Jews uh, um, are returned to uh, Judah um, when the, uh, when the power of Babylon is eclipsed by Persia and uh, Persia conquers Babylon, the first great king of the Persians, uh, um, you know, um, frees the Jews. And, you know, this is very much in, in his interest because he uh, is worried about Egypt and having a, a, an, an allied, uh, you know, kingdom on the border between Persia and Egypt, the, the Jews being so grateful to the Persians that they are, are more than happy to, uh, to swear friendship to him, uh, the, um, is, is very much in the, uh, uh, in the interests of, of Persia. And so, you know, the, the initial stage of attaching themselves to, to to a single God, Yahweh. We see the first um, elements of this in when we move into Canaan the first time. But uh, it's transformed into a new kind of thing, true monotheism, as a result of the Babylonian captivity. And the difference is this. Generally speaking, uh, uh, gods of the ancient world are attached to, uh, to nature, to the physical world around us. And so... And, and they are uh, associated with particular aspects or particular kinds of, of natural activity. Uh, and so we have uh, sky gods that are associated with, uh, with lightning and earthquakes and so forth. And we have um, gods and goddesses of you know, fertility and, and uh, uh, and you know of of the sun and uh, you know of of the sea and so forth and so on, and uh, and you know these are very much associated with the the natural world and often uh, physically uh, bound to particular places. This is especially true amongst the Canaanites, uh, where Baal, for example, uh, was. Uh, associated not just with um, you know particular aspects of the natural world, but with a particular place, a sacred place that would be um, that would be attached to him. Uh, likewise, uh, the um, the building of these uh, these great temples, the ziggurats and so forth, are to provide a a, a new fixed home for gods uh, that they can you know that they can. Uh, um, Exert their you know benevolence and grace on the peoples of of, of cities. 
Uh, and so, you know, God's being bound to the physical world and being bound to place. Uh, the, the Hebrews who end up uh, undergoing these great migrations uh, have a great deal to be concerned about in terms of, uh, in terms of their relationship to the divine. What emerges from this, especially during the Babylonian captivity, is a God that is bound to a people, to a nation, and not to a place. And the idea that there is, therefore, only one God for the Jews, and for the Jews, all other gods are false gods. All other gods are, are, um, are subordinate divine figures, demigods or demons. And so, this again is in contrast to the way that the pagans normally think. Uh, if you, you know, if you travel in the ancient world and you go f from, you know, say, uh, you go from say Nineveh to Babylon, when you arrive in Babylon, you are you have left the domain of your patron god of Nineveh, and you are in the domain of Marduk, the patron god of Babylon. Uh, you, you know, if you travel, f uh, you know, from Corinth to Athens, you travel into the, uh, the, the sphere of influence of Athena. Uh, and so um, uh, this, is, this is a marked contrast. Uh, each and every Jew is... Uh, is always bound to and protected by Yahweh. And uh, each and every Jew is a part of the covenant that, uh, that Yahweh has made to protect the people of, of Judah wherever they might be uh, in return for the soul devotion of the Jews and the adherence to um, the rules uh, that he has made for them, the commandments that he has issued them. And, uh, uh, and this, uh, um, this innovation, this is the first time that monotheism truly emerges in the, in the Mediterranean world. Uh, and it, uh, uh, one of the results for this is that it makes the Jews an, an, an absolutely singular people. Their identity... Um, is, is is entirely separate from and and immensely stronger than uh, all of the other uh, you know pagan peoples around them, and you know from this point onward, you know the the Jews become a problem for any people that seeks to conquer and rule over them, because they will not cannot uh, um, you know separate themselves from their identity, from their covenant, from the protection of their God. So just to put this a little bit more in perspective, uh, so most of the ancient world is polytheistic. Uh, and so, you know, we've seen, we've seen examples of this already, Mesopotamia and Egypt, uh, and amongst the, the Greeks and, uh, their, um, uh, and the Minoans in the Aegean, also amongst the, you know, the other peoples that we haven't really talked about, the Hittites of, of Anatolia, which is now Turkey. Uh, there is a, an intermediate kind of idea called dualism, uh, which is uh, especially prevalent in, in Persia, where it's called Zoroastrianism. The basic idea of dualism is that there are two gods, two forces um, uh, of divinity, and they are equal and balanced, uh, dark and light, order and chaos, um, you know, good and evil. Uh, in, in Zoroastrianism, it's uh, the, the, the god of light and order is Ahura Mazda, and the god of uh, darkness and disorder is Ahriman. Uh, the interesting thing about dualism is that it tends to suggest that uh, individuals have a choice. You can choose to go down one path or another. Uh, and if you go down the path of, of Ahriman, of darkness, then you become, then you're turning your back. On the uh, on the on your people and on the state and become you know an, an enemy. The uh, monotheism emerges with the uh, with the Hebrews, 
uh, and is and is reinforced with the Babylonian captivity in the the people of Judah, the Jews particularly, and this passes on to Christianity, uh, uh, which we'll see some elements of a little bit later on, and also much later in the Middle Ages to Islam, which is like Christianity, a direct descendant of Judaism. So the real question for us is. Uh, the 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 nature of Jewish culture, Jewish religion, Jewish society is transformed during the um, the Babylonian captivity, and um, the Jews that return to uh, uh, Canaan, they return to Judah after the Babylonian captivity, are you know are different, are changed from the Jews that had been deported you know, 70 odd years earlier. And they're changed in, in many remarkable ways. The nature of their faith, the nature of their practices, the nature of their rituals, the nature of their beliefs. Um, and so, you know, one obvious question is they are changed in terms of uh, the suppression of women's participation in religion. Uh, and since uh, the, the Jewish religious identity is very much bound up with their social identity, uh, this has a profound effect on, you know, f you know the uh, female participation in society in general. But it's fundamentally religious. Where is this coming from? Uh, uh, the uh, some of the readings for today uh, uh, deal with this very subject. Uh, the the short answer has to do with the idea that. Um, the, the Jews respond to this covenant uh, in, uh, in a number of ways, including a profound need to be worthy of it, to be worthy of, of Yahweh's love and protection. You know, love, Yahweh's love and protection is conditional. And, uh, you know, and this means that the, the Jews are constantly worried about ensuring that they are um, that they are maintaining uh, God's approval and His uh, His His uh, His respect for uh, the Jews. Uh, this leads to uh, a concentration on purity, uh, on a, on adherence to Mosaic laws, and on you know being the ideal subject. And, you know, there's a central problem with this, uh, that uh, the, the Jews have a very long-standing tradition of, of taboo regarding blood. And so you see where this is going. Uh, the, uh, when a, a woman is experiencing her menstruation, uh, she becomes ritually un impure because she is contaminated with uh, with blood, uh, and so as a result, uh, there is a need to exclude women, um, you know, during their period at least. On top of this, uh, the the Jews become uh, directed toward intense education, uh, religious education in you know the ways of the rituals, in um, in the um, in all of the the, uh, the the laws and and writings that developed during this time, and uh, um, the this education is is heavily dependent on being available to participate at all times on all possible holy days, and you know women are you know are benched by their you know their their menstruations. Uh, on uh, on you know on days that uh, that would require their participation in you know uh, in the the this religious process uh, were they available, and so the result of that is uh, once again that uh, women become excluded from the uh, the religious education that is a necessary part of um, of the uh, you know formal working in the temple. And as a result, are you know, as a gender, become ineligible for, 
you know, priesthood or, you know, any of the supporting roles in, in religious ritual. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, but this is, that is the, the beginning of the story. And you can see more about it in the readings for today. So, uh, there is one book of the Old Testament that I I the Hebraic sacred writings, which the Christians refer to as the Old Testament, uh, which uh, deals with you know a particular Jewish woman and deals with uh, the Babylonian captivity and some of the complexities involved, uh, and uh, so this is uh, this is very much worth um, taking a close look at uh, you know what we think about Esther because uh, you know. Esther does not emerge from this story as being, you know, uh, uh, aggressive and outspoken. Uh, you know, Esther is no, you know, Clytemnestra. Uh, Esther is a, a, you know, fairly reserved figure, and and she's drawn into the court of the Persian king, um, uh, uh, having. Um, you know, having been, you know, sort of leading a dual life. Um, because, yes, there is still, uh, you know, Jewish population in that part of the world, even after most of the Jews have been sent home. And, you know, the, the, the Jews in, you know, Babylon are still maintaining their separate and distinct identity. So, um, uh, there are a number of things to, to look at here. Uh, the, um, the, the characterization of, of Vashti, the, the queen in the beginning of the story, is intriguing. Uh, you know, she uh, refuses a command, and the, the king's response to this is he's offended, you know, not because he gave a command as a king to, his, to one of his queens, but uh, um, because... Uh, she uh, humiliated him as a husband, and this might be a a, uh, a model for you know for other wives. This might be you know this is this might be a humiliation for uh, you know for other husbands in the realm. So you know, take a look at Vashti. Take a look at Esther. Uh, take a look at how Esther. Uh, relates to you know the other characters in the story, not just the king, um, but also you know Mordecai uh, and um, and Haman and so forth, uh, and uh, and see what you think about uh, what this story is trying to say, and why it would have been important to include this story in you know the religious formally uh, adopted religious writings of the Jews. Um, the sacrifice of Isaac. Uh, this is a this is a fascinating um, uh, topic because uh, you know as this uh, as this article points out, um, you know the the viewpoint of Sarah is is missing from this story of, of the sacrifice, and so you know there you know it's left to the speculation of you know later generations of. Uh, of, of, of writers that are attempting to plumb the, 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 you know, the deepest meanings of the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. And, uh, you know, what's striking is that uh, there are multiple paths along which uh, people pursue these speculations. Uh, and in some of them, uh, Sarah is treated, uh, um, you know, in a negative way. And in some of them, you know, Sarah emerges as uh, a figure whose whose faith is tested, just as uh, as much as as um, um, just as much as her husband is. Um, and so, you know, the the idea of of Abraham and Isaac both being tested by God in in distinct and uh, ways characteristic of their roles as husband and wife, father and mother. Um, you know, this is, 
this is a topic that is is you know is well worth taking a look at. The Archer article deals more um, uh, in depth with uh, um, the you know the the topic of women's relationship to Jewish history, uh, and in, in particular, you know we see some some fleshing out of some of the points that I was making and um, uh, and looking for the you know sort of a female response. You know, whenever you have a sense of exclusion, uh, there are a couple of things to bear in mind. First of all, uh, exclusion, uh, uh, as we'll see when we t look at um, the women of Athens in particular, uh, varies across time. It also varies across class. And so the, the ways in which women participate in the formal religion of... Judah is uh, what well, we know most about that is uh, is toward the upper end of society, and um, uh, and the second thing about this is that uh, you know when women have you know formal exclusions and oppressions they tend to find their own ways to assert uh, their their gender identity through their own communities um, through ways of 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 uh, of of collectively expressing themselves, um, you know, either in public or, um, you know, in you know in an insular way, uh, and this is one of the things that also comes up in the Archer, and then Jewish women in Greco uh, Greco Roman Palestine. Um, this is focused on a somewhat later period when the the separation of women from religion has sort of reached its logical extreme, and as, uh, as Archer points out in this article, uh, the only way that women are able to publicly participate in religion is through weeping. Um, but that, uh, that is the, the visible and public part of the story. That is the ritual and religious law part of the story. And what, uh, what happens within the family is, is a profoundly different story. All right, so take a look at all these things, and I'm looking forward to seeing your reactions to the, uh, you know, the, um, the story of gender amongst the Hebrews in the forums.